January 12, 1971. With the official state flag bearing the Confederate battle standard rising high above him, Jimmy Carter rose up to the podium to give his inaugural address as governor of Georgia. Below him stood an almost entirely white audience, all gathered on the grounds of the Capitol building that still housed the statue of a Ku Klux Klan leader. Sitting behind Carter was his predecessor, Lester Maddox, the segregationist governor who once gained notoriety for threatening black students at gunpoint for attempting to enter his restaurant. It was unbeknownst to anyone there that day that the new governor of Georgia was about to break a long-standing tradition in his very first speech. In a state George Wallace carried in the presidential election little over two years prior, Jimmy Carter decided to draw a new line in the dust, tossed his own gauntlet on the feet of Jim Crow, and said, that the time for racial discrimination is over. When the declaration was made, it was still considered unthinkable that in the Deep South, a Democratic governor would come out so openly against racism. The next day, columnist Bill Shipp reported in the Atlantic Constitution that, for a Georgia governor to come out four square against racial discrimination in his very first speech as governor was, to say the least, precedent shattering. If delivered less than a decade earlier, Ship noted, Carter's speech would have been denounced as a talk of wild-eyed liberals or communists or race mixers or worse. Nationwide, the speech continued to reverberate even months later, with a cover story in Time magazine titled, Dixie Whistles a Different Tune. While national reporters in the North may have been more receptive to Carter's rejection of Georgia's Jim Crow past, the speech and this new position left the newly inaugurated governor friendless in his own state. As soon as Carter said, racial discrimination was over, CBS reporter Judy Woodruff recalled that you could just feel the shock going through the crowd. Before Carter had even finished, a dozen state senators walked out, with one of them calling Carter that loving bastard. And Georgia Senator Herman Talmadge said that the governor lost the support of the state Democratic Party overnight. But Carter did not waver. In his first year, he appointed civil rights activist Rita Jackson Samuels on the Council of Human Relations, the first black woman appointed to serve in a senior position in the governor's office of Georgia. Carter also increased the number of black Georgians serving on state boards and commissions from 3 to 55. In 1974, he would go on to put a portrait of Martin Luther King Jr. in the state capitol building, the first African American honored in the gallery. The Ku Klux Klan held a rally outside the capitol as the picture was being unveiled, but inside, a defiant Carter joined with MLK's widow Coretta Scott King to sing, We Shall Overcome. Along with these more symbolic gestures, Governor Carter also enacted numerous meaningful reforms. He addressed the racist criminal justice system by doubling the inmates released on parole and tripling the number of pardons for first-time offenders. In one instance, Jimmy and his wife Rosalind would also fight for the freedom of Mary Prince Fitzpatrick, a black woman who was falsely accused of murder. The Carters hired Mary to be a nanny for their daughter Amy, and they would continue their struggle to overturn her conviction, culminating with a full pardon years later when Jimmy had become president. But Jimmy Carter was not always an advocate for racial justice. He would admit that he never claimed to have been courageous during the civil rights movement. During those pivotal years in the 1960s, Carter mostly sat on the sidelines as state senator. And the way he ended up governing was a far cry from the way he ran his campaign. There was a reason why his audience at the inauguration were all shocked at the speech decrying racism. In contrast to his later policies and positions, Carter the candidate was almost the polar opposite of Carter the governor. Because in his gubernatorial election, Jimmy Carter ran an explicitly racist campaign. On the campaign trail, he identified himself as a Dick Russell Democrat referring to a popular segregationist senator from Georgia. He said if elected, he would invite George Wallace to speak at the state capitol. In the Democratic primary, his campaign team distributed a fact sheet that reminded white racist voters that Carter's more liberal opponent Carl Sanders attended Martin Luther King's funeral. Carter also sought the endorsement of a powerful state representative named Roy V. Harris, a prominent member of the White Citizens Council which vehemently opposed school integration. And in a particularly egregious episode, one of Carter's political strategists, a man named Bill Pope, circulated a leaflet with a photo of Carter's Democratic primary opponent being doused with champagne by a black member of the Atlanta Hawks basketball team. 
Carter himself didn't see the flyer before and went out, but he later tried to justify it with the claim that his campaign was merely trying to show that Sanders was a rich guy who owned a basketball team. Nevertheless, the racial connotations were obvious, and they were underscored when Bill Pope personally distributed copies of the leaflet at a KKK rally. By the end of the September primary runoff, the election had clearly divided along racial lines, with Carter winning about 90% of the rural white vote and his opponent Carl Sanders winning about 90% of the black vote. Jimmy Carter was aware he ran a dirty campaign, but he felt it was the pragmatic thing to do to win in a state that had gone for George Wallace during the presidential election in 1968. The sad reality was that anyone who ran an openly anti-racist campaign in 1970 wouldn't have had a chance to win in a statewide race in Georgia. So Carter decided to make a Faustian pact to run a racist campaign so once in office he could act as an anti-racist reformer. He felt the ends would justify the means. As Carter himself later reflected, if I could rewrite it, I would have made a public statement. I don't want to be associated with Roy V. Harris because they're racist and I'm not racist. But that would have been the end of my political career. This one chapter of Jimmy Carter's political career, a man who ran a racist campaign only to govern as an anti-racist, is reflective of his entire life story, one that stretches into a century. It invites us to see him as a sinner attempting to redeem himself. A born-again Christian who wants to do the best he can to make up for what he has done wrong, and hopes that in the eyes of God, his good deeds will absolve him from the evil he had wrought. But the question remains, should we forgive Jimmy Carter? May 4th, 1974. At the Law Day luncheon at the University of Georgia, Hunter S. Thompson was bored out of his mind. Surrounded by politicians and law students, the gunzo journalists fell out of place. Thompson was the only reporter there and it was only for the purpose of covering Senator Ted Kennedy's speech. But Thompson spent early parts of the luncheon running back and forth several times to his car to spike his iced tea with wild turkey bourbon. As a frontman of the counterculture who witnessed George McGovern's campaign crash and burn, Thompson was worn out of politics. But when it came time for Governor Jimmy Carter to come up on stage, Thompson pricked up. His instincts told him that he was finally going to hear something different and noteworthy. He ran back to his car one more time, not to refill his drink, but to retrieve a tape recorder to make the only recording of what Thompson would later call a king hell bastard of a speech. Carter opened his address by saying, I'm not qualified to talk about the law because in addition of being a peanut farmer, I'm an engineer and a nuclear physicist, not a lawyer. As he continued his speech, Carter emphasized how inexperienced he was on the subject of the day, saying he didn't even know the definition of a consent search warrant. And he told a story about how he had asked members of the Judicial Selection Committee what it was, to which they apparently said, One of them stayed to the front door and knocked on it, and the other one ran around to the back door and he had come in. So, In a room full of law students, Carter said he wanted to talk about some of the practical aspects of human government. He is still deeply concerned about the inadequacies of a system of which it's obvious that you are so patently found. In what one wouldn't expect as part of a law day address, Carter shocked both Thompson and the audience by attacking the state's legal institutions. He reminded his listeners that Martin Luther King Jr. was perhaps despised by many in this room because he shook up our social structure that benefited us. He mocked the criminal justice system for excessive sentences for minor crimes, saying, You can go into prisons of Georgia, and I don't know, it may be that poor people are the only ones who commit crimes, but I do know they are the only ones who serve prison sentences. Carter went even further by going after other establishment institutions from the Chamber of Commerce to the American Medical Association. And towards the end of his speech, he lashed out against the elites, saying that, the greatest historical event and 
Hunter S. Thompson was awestruck and called Carter the voice of an angry agrarian populist. He described the speech, which had also made references to a wide range of figures from the theologian Reinhard Niebuhr to the cultural icon Bob Dylan as the heaviest and most eloquent thing I have ever heard from the mouth of a politician. Thompson was a hard man to impress, but he would later write in Rolling Stone magazine that Carter was one of the most intelligent politicians I have ever met and also one of the strangest. One has to be impressed by the fact that an evangelical Christian from Georgia was able to win over the hedonistic and anti-religious Hunter S. Thompson. But in the 1970s, Jimmy Carter was unlike anybody else. What Thompson and voters would find refreshing was his willingness to speak out against the establishment. His maverick character was evident in other dichotomies. A white southerner who admired Martin Luther King Jr. and a cool Christian who enjoyed rock music. He seemed like a politician who was truly different and the stars aligned for Jimmy Carter as the American public wanted nothing more than a real outsider as president. When Jimmy Carter entered the 1976 Democratic primary, almost no one thought he could actually win. It was considered so unthinkable that even when Carter told his mother that he was running for president, she responded, President of what? Early polls from January to June 1975 had Carter averaging at 1% support from Democratic primary voters. Even as late as January of 1976, as the primary season was just getting underway with the Iowa caucus, he still trailed at a meager 4%. But Carter had an advantage that would soon change those numbers. His rival candidates, it turns out, were either ideologically too extreme to unite the party or part of the DC bubble that voters had grown to despise. In one poll conducted before the Iowa caucus, the segregationist governor George Wallace led with 20% support. Behind him at just 10% was Senator Henry Scoop Jackson, who had alienated the left with his hawkish foreign policy views and support for the Vietnam War. Coming in in third was Senator Birch Baya, whose blundering campaign is best summarized by his slogan, which boasted to voters that he was proud to be a politician. With over 10 candidates, Carter was able to play the crowded field to his advantage. He campaigned in every state, which was a rarity in 1970. In particular, this made Carter a sharp contrast with the leading right-wing candidates of George Wallace and Scoop Jackson, both of whom made the pivotal mistake of not campaigning in either Iowa or New Hampshire. This left only the liberal candidates competing amongst themselves for the same voting bloc. This allowed Carter, in the meantime, to consolidate the moderate vote and end up the victor in those two crucial states. Similarly, when the competitive left-wing candidates made the decision to skip Florida, Scoop Jackson and George Wallace split the conservative votes, opening the way for Carter alone to consolidate the progressives. In other words, Jimmy Carter was elevated to front-runner status by running as a right-winger in the North and a left-winger in the South. He was a centrist who could play both sides. By the second half of the primary season, however, there were legitimate concerns that Carter was perhaps too moderate. And so he worked to reassure liberals of his credentials on social issues. On racial inequality, it helped that Martin Luther King Sr., the father of the slain civil rights leader, had endorsed Carter. And on other issues that placated liberals, Carter held campaign events with a group known as Gays for Carter. Later as president, Carter did not retreat from his support and would become the first president to invite gay activists to the White House. But when it came to economic issues, Carter was no progressive. He was not, as Hunter S. Thompson assumed, an angry agrarian populist. Stylistically, yes, he was the outsider, the peanut farmer from Plains, Georgia with the boyish name Jimmy, but Carter had no stomach for waging the kind of class warfare that was the hallmark of genuine populism. On the contrary, Carter's economic platform was manifestly conservative. Breaking away from the New Deal tradition of spending and redistributing wealth, Carter ran, instead, on balancing budgets. And by the time of the general election, he would even campaign with right-wingers like George Wallace in Alabama and would tell supporters, we Southerners believe in work, not welfare. And just like a Republican, once he became president, Carter not only failed to balance the budget, he would actually increase the national deficit by cutting the capital gains tax, the corporate income tax, all the while increasing defense spending by more than 5%. Although he still had liberal credentials on social issues, the left-wing critics who had accused Jimmy Carter of being too moderate on economic grounds turned out to be correct. After clinching the nomination for the Democratic primary and eventually winning the general election against Gerald Ford, 
Carter ushered in a new era of politics that would prove disastrous for the working class. He would break away from the tradition of the New Deal policies of FDR or the Great Society of LBJ and would bring fiscal conservatism into the Democratic Party. Among his many policies that helped usher in the new Washington Consensus, Carter saw through tax cuts for the wealthy, with the Revenue Act of 1978, deregulation of the financial industry, with the Deregulation and Monetary Control Act of 1980, and the privatization of industry, with the Airline Deregulation Act of 1978. He even went as far as appointing Paul Volcker as the chair of the Federal Reserve, and Volcker is often considered by many to be the modern architect of neoliberalism. Additionally, Carter used his brand of fake populism to sell this new liberal ideology to the American public. When even journalists like Hunter S. Thompson could be sold on Carter's anti-establishment vibes, it is easy to imagine how ordinary working class Americans also fell for the act. In many ways, Carter's economic snake oil salesmanship became the model for his successors who have also used phony populism to mask their work on behalf of corporate interests once in office. Bill Clinton is a prime example. Like Carter, Clinton was a governor from the South. This alone bestowed the coveted outsider status on Clinton. But he could also cloak his elitist background by belting out jazzy tunes on the saxophone and quoting scripture like a Sunday school teacher. And just as Carter was able to fool Hunter S. Thompson, Clinton could also present himself as sort of a working class champion well enough to prompt Toni Morrison into calling him the first black president. In reality, Clinton's populist image came without genuine commitment. As president, he was responsible for the incarceration of black and brown Americans at unprecedented levels, while making it a priority to pardon billionaire financiers like Mark Rich. It is true that Carter's brand of neoliberalism was much more mild in comparison to that of Bill Clinton or Ronald Reagan, and what all his successors did was objectively worse. Nevertheless, Carter has the dubious honor of being the first neoliberal democratic president the first to break away from the New Deal policies. And the consequences of the neoliberal ideology that Carter unleashed have caused nothing but immense suffering for the working class. Since 1979, wages for the top 1% have more than doubled, and the bottom 90% have only seen an increase of 29%. The 2008 economic crash led to an eviction of 10 million Americans from their homes. And as of recording this in 2024, homelessness, childhood poverty, and deaths of despair continue to rise at record levels. So when I ask the question, should we forgive Jimmy Carter, it is within the context of this legacy and his responsibility in ushering a period of unprecedented wealth disparity. There were essentially two major factors that contributed to Jimmy Carter's loss in his re-election bid in 1980. The staggering economy and of course, the Iran hostage crisis. On the economy, President Carter does, indeed, deserve the blame. His chair of the Federal Reserve, Paul Volcker, made the pivotal decision to raise interest rates in an election year. And while this policy helped curve inflation, unemployment grew and the economy went into a slump. The situation, it must be noted, would only get worse during Ronald Reagan's presidency as he kept Volcker as the head of the Fed. Unemployment, as well, would increase further during Reagan's first two years. But as far as Carter was concerned, the damage had been done, and the fall of the staggering economy in the late 1970s can clearly be laid on Carter's feet. However, we must reach a different conclusion when it comes to the Iran hostage crisis. Here though, in the other major cause for his loss to Reagan in 1980, Carter's actions were actually quite commendable. To give a brief background, in 1979, Iran's dictator, also known as the Shah, was overthrown in the Iranian revolution and forced into exile. The Shah sought refuge in the United States for medical treatment, but Jimmy Carter resisted allowing the former dictator into the country, fearing retaliation from the new Iranian government. Carter, however, was alone in foreseeing the consequences of letting the former Iranian dictator into the United States. When his Secretary of State Cyrus Vance urged Carter to allow the Shah to come to the US, Carter's response was prescient. What are you guys going to advise me to do, he asked, if they overrun our embassy and take our people hostage. When Carter's Vice President Walter Mondale sided with Vance, Carter, for the first and only time during his presidency, lost his composure in front of his White House staff, shouting, F the Shah, I'm not going to let him in when he has other places to go where he'll be perfectly safe. 
But people both in and outside the White House continued to pressure President Carter. The leading critic was former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, who said it was morally wrong to treat the Shah like a flying Dutchman seeking a port of call. In addition to the soundbite, Kissinger also made rounds in DC, labeling Carter as the president who lost Iran. Things got so bad that Carter's chief of staff Hamilton Jordan warned the president that Kissinger would have a field day if the Shah wouldn't be allowed in the US. Eventually, Jimmy Carter relented to his advisors and critics. And sure enough, as soon as the Shah was allowed into the United States, the Iranian revolutionaries took hostages from the American embassy, just as Carter had predicted. The hostage crisis was bad enough, but after the US military botched an operation to rescue the hostages in April 1980, Jimmy Carter's poll numbers nosedived. The writing was on the wall. Ronald Reagan would win in the upcoming election that November. The irony, however, is that the Iranian hostage crisis was when President Carter showed true leadership. To appreciate that, we have to look at not what he did, but what he ultimately refused to do. Carter was urged by his advisors to launch airstrikes against Iran in conjunction with the rescue operation, but the president firmly opposed taking such a step. Once we start killing people in Iran, where will it end? The president asked in one meeting. Even the rescue operation itself was a cause for concern. What are we going to do if they take 20 of our marines and kill one of them every morning at sunrise? Are we going to go to war with Iran? Carter was certainly aware of the political benefit in taking a more aggressive line against Iran. He must have understood how military intervention against Iran would have created a rally around the flag effect that would in turn have helped defeat his Republican opponent. Years later, on his 90th birthday, Carter also reflected, I could have been re-elected if I had taken military action against Iran, shown that I was strong, resolute, and manly. I could have wiped Iran off the map with the weapons that we had, but in the process, a lot of innocent people would have been killed. In the end, Carter left the White House with a unique distinction setting him apart from every US president in the post-World War II era. He never dropped bombs on another country. Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and even Ford all presided over airstrikes against foreign nations. And since Carter, from Ronald Reagan in Libya to Joe Biden in Syria, Every occupant of the White House at one time or another has rained bombs down on helpless men, women, or children. And this is the great irony of the Iran hostage crisis. His refusal to order airstrikes led to Carter's defeat in the 1980 presidential election because he was seen as soft or weak. But in the end, his refusal to drop bombs, even with the pressure he received, has made him the most humane president of the post-World War II era. While Jimmy Carter comes off as a humanitarian when compared to other US presidents, this is still a fairly low bar for judging one's moral character. Carter was still at the helm of the American empire during the Cold War. And while he never directly took the country into a war, there were times when Carter was as much of an imperialistic menace as his fellow presidents. His handling of Iran alone does not tell the full story of Jimmy Carter's foreign policy. Yes, he prevented many innocent deaths, his refusal to drop bombs still deserves credit, but that does not mean that he led an administration without blood on its hands. We must be honest and consider the full picture. To tell the proper story, we need to go back to a year before Jimmy Carter was elected president. On December 6, 1975, Gerald Ford Secretary of State Henry Kissinger traveled to Jakarta and personally met with Indonesian dictator Suharto as part of the Cold War strategy to support anti-communists, whether they be democratic leaders or authoritarians. Kissinger gave Suharto his blessing and assurance that the US would have his back if he invaded East Timor. The Indonesian leader wasted no time. The very next day, Suharto launched an invasion, and after 6-7 to seven months of fighting, Indonesian forces killed an estimated 60,000 Timorese. Although the invasion began and ended under President Ford, the occupation of East Timor continued, with some of the bloodiest guerrilla warfare occurring under President Jimmy Carter's watch. In March 1977, an Australian diplomat named James Dunn published an account of Indonesia's occupation and alleged that 100,000 civilians had been killed. In his testimony to Congress, Dunn said that the situation in East Timor might well constitute, relatively speaking, the most serious case of contravention of human rights facing the world. In response, Carter's State Department issued a memo saying that Dunn's account of the casualty figures was greatly exaggerated. Yet, the State Department still failed to provide any evidence to refute Dunn's claims. It certainly made sense for the Carter administration to ignore the harsh reality. 
To admit that East Timor was facing the worst human rights crisis wouldn't have been a good look for President Carter, who sold more military aid to the Indonesian dictator than the previous Ford administration. There was, however, a flimsy justification the Carter administration gave. The argument goes that by having closer diplomatic ties with Indonesia, the US would have better success by leveraging its influence to promote human rights. So in 1977, when Mozambique and Guinea-Bissau submitted a UN resolution calling for a ceasefire and admission of a UN fact-finding mission in East Timor, Carter's State Department recommended a vote against it. The State Department explicitly argued in its memo that it was a way to remove this irritant as we continue pressuring the government of Indonesia for progress and human rights matters throughout Indonesia as well as in East Timor. To be fair, Carter did succeed in pressuring Suharto to release 30,000 political prisoners. On the surface, this may seem a significant triumph in terms of human rights. But the release of 30,000 political prisoners pales in comparison to the genocide of 200,000 people, which is the estimated number of deaths reached by 1999. Carter certainly could have done more. He could have cut ties or simply refused to sell weapons to Indonesia entirely. Even if Carter saved 30,000 political prisoners, we have to take into account the number of people killed with the weapons Suharto got from Jimmy Carter's government. Carter's vice president, Walter Mondale, even noted that the release of political prisoners helped create a favorable climate with respect to congressional members who had been critical of the arms sales. And after meeting with Suharto himself in May 1978, Mondale suggested to the Indonesian dictator that he release more prisoners as a way to shift public opinion and defuse Carter's critics. Could we say Jimmy Carter was just ignorant of the humanitarian situation in East Timor? Did he get false information from the State Department and his vice president? It seems unlikely that Carter was unaware of the extent of the disaster taking place. Even if Carter ignored the testimony from Australian diplomat James Dunn, he only needed to listen to what the Indonesian leaders themselves were saying. As early as 1977, Indonesian Foreign Minister Adam Malik admitted to journalists that between 50,000 to 80,000 people had died since the invasion. At best, we can say President Carter was inept and incompetent in failing to acknowledge or act upon the human rights crisis in East Timor. At worst, Carter did know, with the unsettling conclusion that he was a monster who just didn't care. So back to the question, should we forgive Jimmy Carter? There is no question as president, Carter's neoliberal economic policies or his actions in East Timor had a devastating impact on people's lives. But we still need to take into account that Carter's post-presidency has been nothing like his political career. His philanthropy since leaving the White House have objectively improved the lives of millions. And just as he tried to compensate for the racist gubernatorial campaign by governing as an anti-racist, it is as if Carter had also tried to redeem himself for the sins he committed as president. The Carter Center, for instance, has almost completely eradicated the Guinea worm disease, from affecting 3.5 million people in the 1980s to just a few hundred cases worldwide. In Nigeria, the Carter Center cut the infection rate for river blindness from 55% in 1991 to 0.4% in 2009. And as board chairman, Jimmy Carter helped make Habitat for Humanity into the largest not-for-profit home builder in the world for millions of poor families. In addition to his philanthropy, Jimmy Carter has also been a strong voice against American imperialism, calling the United States the most warlike nation in the history of the world. He not only spoke out against the invasion of Iraq in 2003, he even opposed the Gulf War, which had widespread US public support. And on the question of Palestine, he was one of the very first mainstream American public figures to call Israel's treatment of Palestinians apartheid. When he visited Gaza in 2009, he said he had to hold back tears while attacking the US-Israel response, saying, Never before in history has a large community like this been savaged by bombs and missiles and then been deprived of the means to repair itself. And unlike other former presidents, Jimmy Carter also didn't choose to profit from his status. While Barack Obama owns a $12 million estate at Martha's Vineyard as well as an $8 million mansion in Washington DC, Carter retired to a $167,000 two-bedroom home in Plains, Georgia. With Bill and Hillary Clinton collectively having made over $150 million in speaking fees, Carter seldom accepted any such fees except on the rare occasion when he did to raise money for charity. Although every former president flies in private jets, Carter regularly used commercial airlines where he enjoyed shaking hands with passengers. 
But do these admirable actions and qualities of Carter's post-presidency allow us to see his legacy in a positive light? Can we really praise his work building homes for the poor when he was the one who ushered in the new liberal ideology that left so many homeless? Should we admire his work advocating on behalf of the Palestinians when hundred thousands were killed in East Timor? Does he deserve to be recognized as an anti-racist when his initial rise to power came through racist appeals? I end this episode without an answer on whether or not we should forgive Jimmy Carter and I welcome everyone to write in the comment section of this video to give your own verdict. However, I do believe Jimmy Carter is a case study that proves the famous adage attributed to Lord Acton. Power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The disturbing reality is that power will always corrupt even the best of humanity. I do believe Jimmy Carter in his heart of hearts was a good person, but even he was capable of doing great evil when he was seeking higher political office or when he actually wielded the extraordinary power of being president of the United States. The fact that it was only after leaving the White House that Jimmy Carter did his most humane accomplishments only seems to corroborate the truth of Lord Acton's axiom. Once free from the corrupting influence of power, Carter's moral compass corrected itself and he was truly born again. This is the final lesson we should take away from Jimmy Carter's life. None of us should ever believe that we can be exempt from power tainting our souls.